This week, it's our birthday. We are 1,000 episodes young. And to mark it, we're making the BBC's first interactive, multi-choice TV show. There will be flowcharts, elephants, flowcharts, data, flowcharts, and wizards. A warm welcome to Click. 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 I'm Spencer Kelly. Finally, we have reached a very special milestone. We have been on air every week of every year without a break since we launched in the year 2000, which means this week you are watching season one, episode 1000. And to celebrate, we are making a world first. Doing new things is in our DNA. Floating on air! Which is why we don't just show you the tech, we use the tech to push the boundaries of what's possible on TV. Here's the team. It's Mark on camera one and two, Simon on three and four, Jen on five, Nima on six and seven, Ben on eight, and this is Talia on nine. This was the world's first full TV programme to be filmed and edited only on mobile devices. FYI, it was a nightmare. This week's flick has been filmed entirely in 360 degrees. This was another world first, where we reinvented how TV was made for an audience that could look in any direction at any time. And this week, for Click 1000s, We've really gone for it. Do I explore the cave or do I look behind the tree? I'll explore the cave. So, turn to page 84. This is how I spent a lot of my childhood, reading books where I could choose my own adventure, where at every point I got to decide what happened next and every time I read it, the story changed. I absolutely loved them. Not only was I in a different world, but because I was in charge of the story, that story came to life. It felt so real. Come on, that's Monday. So after Choose Your Own Adventure books came computer adventure games, first with text and then with amazing graphics, but both would let me explore vast worlds bigger than any book. But the problem is TV doesn't let us do that. It tells one story, it makes one set of choices and we just sit back and watch. Until now. <laughs> Imagine if everything that you watched was interactive and if you could change your experiences depending on your mood, your desires, or even how much time you had. If you go online at the address that's on screen now, you will find a special version of this programme that is interactive. You get to choose which text stories you hear about and in how much detail. As you watch, you'll be given options to dive deeper or maybe to look at things from a different perspective or maybe to skip on entirely. The technology used to make this possible is known as object-based media or OBM and it could be the future of how we watch video content. Broadcasters have been developing the tech for years now. BBC R&D has explored the concept with various online tutorials. The step-by-step -step nature of OBM is particularly useful there. Netflix has had a dabble with its Puss in Boots and more recently with Charlie Brooker's interactive Bandersnatch. We talk to me. And now, premiering the BBC's first OBM TV show is us. 
to say it's been a tricky, brain-melting minefield would be an understatement. It's a little bit like trying to pick up ants from space using tweezers uh, with a blindfold on. These are all the plans that we've made to figure out how we're going to structure this this episode and it's a real, really a, a bit of a beast. Doing OBM is really not simple because you have to really think about the stories in a different way because people might have watched some bits of the story, not seen the other bits, they may have chosen different paths through the story. I've been told to create 700 million versions. It's taken more brain power than any episode I've ever worked on and more teamwork to get the thing out there. Trust me, we're not talking to each other at the moment. But we couldn't have done it without R&D's otherworldly expertise. Matthew and his team have been devising an OBM strategy for the last few years. A couple of years ago, we decided we we wanted to kind of transfer this capability to create this stuff. We were busy engineering it, um, but we didn't have any tools. So uh, we decided to build StoryKit, essentially. Their custom-made software can handle hundreds of pieces of content like video, audio and text and put them together on the fly as viewers make their choices. So it's a tool um, that's aimed at producers who have uh, no software development skills. So the whole idea was to allow these people to then easily uh, use an interface like a drag and drop interface like Storyformer to create those, those experiences. All in all, we think we have 148 different chunks of video, which to my mind makes about a gazillion different paths through the content. There's also tons of footage and we've used up every hard drive that we have. I suppose it's been keeping me up at night thinking, are we going to get it finished in time? It really has been a challenging process and there has been times when I had to do just that. But we think, we really think it's been worth it. Putting you in the driving seat will mean, hopefully, you at home can enjoy the show more than ever before. At the core of being able to give you all these choices is the idea of branching narratives, possible options that lead on to the next bit or reroute you to a part where the story can flow from there. To get advice on how to create our multiple choice click, I went to meet one of the creators of the fighting fantasy books I grew up with, Ian Livingstone. It involves writing multiple storylines at once and how I used to do it um, was create a, a map uh, which I kept a record of all the encounters as you went through the adventure. It's given you a choice like do you want to turn left or right which is a simple choice or do you want to try and tiptoe past the sleeping goblin or attack him with your sword. Yeah. So the choices are quite varied. So when I'm writing, I have to keep a record of where the reader would go. So if you make this choice, I need to make sure that they can actually get out of there. And then these are all the encounters. They find gold, they find treasure, they find magical items. Can I show you our version of an adventure map? This is the, the layout of this actual interview, which is multi-choice. What do you think? Uh, minimalist. <laughs> Not too many options, so we should be done in less than four hours because it can take you days to get through a fighting fantasy game book. Good luck on your adventure. That was Ian Livingstone talking to one of his biggest fanboys. Now currently normal TV doesn't allow us to show you a fully interactive program. So to give you a feel of what Click OBM will be like when you watch it online, we've added a dash of it to this week's tech news. You will see some options pop up on screen. You won't be able to click them. We'll do that for you, but it should give you an idea of what to expect. Here's Lara. Hello and welcome to The Week in Tech. This week, the Church of England issued its first guidelines for social media users. Its release came the same time as the Archbishop of Canterbury streamed his own live video. Nearly a decade ago, Alphabet, that owns Google, announced its balloon spin-out, Loon. This promised floating masts that would deliver 4G services to the world's most remote places. Loon is now preparing to launch its first commercial trial with African network Telcom Kenya. 
Loon's balloons are each the size of a tennis court, but they do need to be as they're filled with enough helium to keep them afloat whilst carrying solar-powered networking gear. This robot bear is quite aptly called Huggable. A new trial suggests it could help poorly children feel better in hospital. More than 50 sick kids took part in the study with MIT Media Lab, Northeastern University and Boston Children's Hospital. The high-tech toy not only brought out more smiles, but also got the kids out of bed to be more active too. Huggable is far from the only cute robot on the block, though. In Europe, this little robot even goes to school for sick children. This means they can virtually attend classes and play with their friends. And finally, an American artist has built robotic arms to let you poke, inflate and generally play around with famous paintings. Neil Mendoza's mechanical masterpieces is displayed at the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh. That's it. And in the interactive version of Click, you can steer your own way through Lara's tech news. But with great power comes great responsibility. I mean, do you really want to make decisions about the TV programme and films that you watch? Or would you rather just sit back and relax? And also, if you want to talk to your friends about what you've seen, but they've seen a different version of the show, you don't have that common ground. And then there's another thing. Through interactive experiences, it's possible to keep tabs on viewers' habits. And you may be giving out more information about yourself than you think. Here's Jen Copesteak with more. Extrovert or introvert? open to new experiences or more comfortable with tradition. We're using the data we collect while you watch the OBM show to deliver a specific advert to you. The choices you made actually gave us an idea of your personality. It's certainly not scientific, but when you try it out, see if we were right. Researchers have worked out that even simple data leaks can give indications about your personality, with just 75 Facebook likes being as illuminating as asking a work colleague about you. And with 300 likes, they can be as accurate as asking your partner. You can infer some very private stuff, even from this data that you think is you know, not too meaningful. Um, so people's personality, people's intelligence, people's political views, religious views, sexuality, really private stuff, just because you like camping and a few other things. Of course, we all recognize when Facebook, Google, or Instagram do this, showing adverts tailored to our online behavior, which can be good if you're looking for a specific item, but can also be a bit unnerving. So people often say that online advertising is creepy. So you're talking to a friend, and then later on you see an advertisement for the same thing that you're talking about. It might just be that um, you're talking to your friend, but then the fact that you're talking to someone else, they may search for something, and then suddenly you're seeing an advert for something that they're interested in because they infer that you're friends, so therefore you probably have similar interests. And if all this creeps you out a bit, we had a look to see some of the tools online that may help obscure your data trail. First up, you might want to get rid of the cookies that are stored in your browser. These store personal data, like your login, email address, and what's in your shopping basket. Clear the cookies from your web browser using the appropriate menu. In Chrome, it is in the history settings. In Safari, look in Preferences and Privacy to choose to block all cookies or manage which ones have access. Cookies aren't the end of the problem. Other types of trackers can still follow you around. Some ad blockers and anti-tracking tools can show you who's watching. Privacy Badger from the Electronic Frontier Foundation is free to add to your browser. It shows you which domains are following your online movements and lets you choose which ones to allow or block. Ghostry flags even more spying eyes. Other services will help you stay on top of trackers for a price. Disconnect.me has a free basic service for desktop as well as smartphone apps. For $50 a year, you can get a full VPN and tracker protection for three devices. Still, even with all these tools, you may not be completely private or untracked. Have a look at Who Tracks Me. It shows some popular entertainment and news sites are crawling with unseen trackers. 
If, like more than 60% of us, you use Chrome, it won't be easy to stop Google keeping tabs on you. However, an alternative like Mozilla's Firefox is privacy focused. When you install Firefox, you see the privacy settings it offers straight away. Firefox is also the only major open source browser, which means anyone can check its code, making it more trustworthy. Finally, there are some more whimsical ways that you can try and obscure your data. The Go Rando plugin lets you confuse Facebook snoopers, randomizing your emoji reactions, preventing their ability to build a personality data profile. Be warned, this might get you in trouble if you end up laughing at something awkward. Another tool designed by Ben Grosser is the Demetricator. The Demetricator hides the like counters on Twitter and Facebook, so you aren't giving out data or being influenced by what others are liking. Instagram made its own version of this too. That was Gem. So how might algorithms change what you watch in the future on TV based on your personal data? Well, to simulate this, we've taken Dan Simmons' report on tech in Malawi and tailored it for a viewer who we know is interested in inventions and the environment, but who likes watching shorter reports. This could be the result. With an average income of just a few dollars a day, this part of the world is known as one of the poorest on the planet. What's less well known is how quickly Malawi's two main cities, the capital, Lilongwe, and the commercial center here in Blantyre are expanding as are their horizons. And Malawi has a lot more high tech than you might think going on. Do you want to know more? Well, how long have you got? Researchers are developing artificial intelligence, creating smart homes, predicting health problems, and making old computers work again for the whole continent. In some ways, Malawi's cities look and feel like many others. There's plenty of shops and services, new buildings are going up. But importantly, there's a real need here for more simple tech that makes life better without the need for power. Only a fraction of the country is actually on the power grid, and even those who have it, well, historically, it's been unreliable. Demand far outstrips supply. And it gets hot here as well. In the summer between 30 and 35, even now at a cooler time of year, it gets up to the mid-20s. I'm on my way to meet a very cool inventor who specialises in sustainable tech. Hey, Addis. How's that? Hi. Thanks for having us over. <laughs> nice workshop. Anele Iro, or Addis as he's better known, leads a team of half a dozen or so at his home in Blantyre. All sorts of things are being hacked together here. It's a mashup of ideas. This skeleton car will be on the road next month, I'm told, powered in part by steam. This tin can electric car uses phone ID for security. And that's just one SIM card that that works with, is that? <laughs> Even Addis's pottery wheel helps power things up. So has anybody before <laughs> called you a mad professor with all, with all of this stuff? Well, yes, I wasn't quite used to that. In the heat of the day, I've come to see a prototype Addis is particularly proud of. Well, this is the, uh, the zero electric climate control system. The main thing here is what I call the cooling element. Okay. Well, it takes water and it presents it to the environment, right? Mm -hmm. So the heat in the environment help it evaporate. That process cools things down. Sounds very simple, yeah. but it's, it's, there's a bit more to it than that, isn't there? Here, we have formulated materials that already are folded up so tightly that they shrink a large amount of space into a very small space, right? At nanoscale, when we put water into it, that water can be spread out and it can, it can use up heat more efficiently to cool us down. Right, time to test our water climate cooler. So did the invention work? That's the question. Well, you can find out by watching the Click OBM show online and choosing to watch Dan's piece. Of course, there are many more adventures waiting for you there too. 
We're really proud of our interactive programme and we would love you to stop by and choose your own path through it. The address is on the screen now, bbc.co.uk slash click 1000. We think it's a, a fitting way to celebrate our anniversary. There is another way too, of course, and that's to crack open the archive, look at the silly old tech and try and ignore the haircuts. Hello, I'm Stephen Cole. A warm welcome to Click Online, the first of a new series for all those interested in new technology and the internet. In April 2000, the BBC decided to explore the exciting new world of the dot-com bubble. And in a spectacular piece of timing, Click Online went on air just as it burst. As online dog walkers and wine tasting services tumbled around our ears, the programme went looking for the next big thing. I told you I could do it. We didn't always find it. Uh oh, I forgot to change the batteries. But every so often, we backed a winner. Gmail is a free email service. Twitter.com is as simple as it gets. It's called Bluetooth. The device with some never-before-seen features has been billed as nothing short of revolutionary. We've met all sorts of amazing characters on our travels. It's me, Mario! And I mean all sorts. La, 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 la. Hey! We push tech to its limits. Oh oh Sometimes we pushed it too far. We are going to build an artificial intelligence. And sometimes it pushed back. They came here on a sort of gold rush, promised riches from waste and slowly poisoning them. Right now, over 20,000 compromised personal computers are under our control. It's been a pretty intense experience. But the thing that it's really left me with is I want to hold on to my data. Over the past 19 years, we have built it. We've flown it. We've ridden it. We've broken it. We've worn it. Even the electric shorts. <laughs> wow! And we've played it. Oh, boy, have we played it. Lose the house lights. We've gone live. We've seen the very highest tech. <laughs> this is um, a bit spiritual, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the lowest. Over 1,000 shows, it's been an enormous privilege for all of us to bring all of you the tech that's changed the world. Refreshing. Or not. Come on, Percy. Yeah, it certainly feels like we've seen it all, but I have a suspicion that there is much, much more to come. <laughs> and next week, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the moon landings, we'll bring you Click 1001, A Space Odyssey. Until then, on behalf of everyone who's worked on this programme over the years, and there have been many. Thank you. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.